Well, I, I believe the Lord has a word for us, so I want to get into this, and um, man, I'm going to have to break it up. Um, okay. Well, let's go, let's go right into it. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 15 and Luke chapter 13. Matthew 15 and Luke 13. And um, I wanted to start, you know, we've been in the series called So Great, talking about the many benefits that have been made available to us through what Jesus has done for us. And we have been talking not so much about the specific benefits, right? There's, the, the Bible is full of promises that are available to us, promises of healing, promises of provision, promises of deliverance, right, uh, of freedom, of peace, right, of, of strong marriages and, and kids, raising kids. Like, there's all these promises, and, and we really haven't spent a whole lot of time talking about what those individual promises are in the Bible are, right? That's why it's important for us to get into the Word, to read them, to know them. But I believe what the Lord's been trying to convey to us and where He's been leading us in this series is He wants us as a church and as a people to be convinced that these promises are for you, that these promises are secured. He has sworn not just with His Word, He has sworn with a blood covenant through Jesus Christ on the cross. He has sealed His promise with blood saying, I want you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that these things that I've spoken and made available for you, they're yours. They're yours. But we have to position ourselves to receive it, okay? We talked a little bit about that after our time of worship, that one of the ways we position ourselves is by giving thanks and praise and, and trusting and believing that what he says is true. Before you even have, have it in, you see it evident in your life, you are already beginning to give thanks, okay? You guys with me this morning? And so I believe that there is covenant promises that God is saying, I want these things to come to pass, but you have to be convinced that they are for you. Everybody say, it's for me. It's for me. And this is what I want to talk about today, is that it belongs to you. It belongs to you. It's not even just available. It's already yours. Okay? So I'm going to bring a simple word today. We're, we're, we don't have a ton of time. So I'm going to start in Genesis chapter 12. You don't need to turn there, but we talked about this scripture last week, and so I would encourage you to check out that message uh, about the covenant benefits. But this is when God appears to Abram. This was before he was known as Abraham, and, and God initiates covenant with Abraham, okay? And we spent the last week talking about how this covenant that God made with Abraham, how this covenant also relates to us. And when he was speaking to Abraham, he had us in mind all along. And so it come, we come to Genesis chapter 12, starting at verse 1. It says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now notice what it says there at the end. And in you, Abraham, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God is clearly speaking to Abraham that, Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless your descendants. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. But when he says, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed, how many of you know he has now shifted the attention to all of us? Amen? And we spent our time talking about last week that, that he, because of what Jesus has done, if we are in Christ, we are now the heirs and the seed of Abraham and heirs to the promise. Okay? And so now he is talking about all of us as well. We read in Galatians chapter 3.29, it says, And if you are Christ." then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So in other words, when you come into Jesus and you are born again, it is literally as though you were born into the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Are you guys with me? As God's chosen people. That's what makes all those covenant promises in the Old Testament available to you. Okay? But how many of you know we also have new covenant promises? Okay? When Jesus died on the cross, there was a, are you, anybody here thankful for salvation? Right? And in eternity with him, okay? New covenant, we're so thankful, right? Okay? 
But all those Old Testament promises, if you belong to Christ, they belong to you as well. Amen? And so we spent our time talking about that last week. Now I want to look at two examples, two stories today about how this operates in our lives. And so I want to share a story out of Matthew chapter 15, and I had you turn there. And we're going to start at verse 21. And this is an encounter that Jesus had with a Gentile woman. This was a woman that did not have covenant with God. She was not born into the family of Abraham. She was not a descendant of Abraham. She was a woman from Canaan and a Gentile woman. And so Matthew chapter 15, verse 21, it says, Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan, okay, it's a Gentile woman, came from that region and cried out to Jesus, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. Okay? Now, we would today, a lot of times, especially in our country, we medicate that symptom away. There's a lot of times where there are people that are wrestling with demonic oppression that, that we just kind of medicate and hide away. Okay? But other countries have a very real understanding of this. And they acknowledge openly, yes, there are spirits and there are people that have, are filled with bad spirits, and there are people that are filled with good spirits. The rest of the world is more aware of this than us. And at this time, people were very aware, okay, that there was demonic oppression. So this woman is coming to Jesus saying, my, my daughter is severely demon-possessed, demon and she needs help. Have mercy on me. Notice what Jesus says in verse 23, but he answered her, not a word. Well, that doesn't sound like Jesus. I mean, isn't Jesus supposed to be just that nice guy that welcomes everybody that's like, hey, how can I bless you today? Like, you know, where, where he's walking like the Pope and everybody's trying to touch him, right? Like, isn't that the Jesus? But notice Jesus, he says, he answers her, not a word. And his disciples came and urged him saying, send her away, for she cries out after us. In other words, they're saying, listen, I'm done. We've been ministering all day, right? And not only do, are we tired? You're not a Jew. In other words, you're not in covenant with, with God. You're not under that covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so they say, send her away, for she cries out after us. But he, Jesus, answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In other words, when Jesus was sent to his earthly ministry, he was not sent at that time to minister to the Gentiles. He was sent to minister to the Jewish people, those who had covenant with God. And so Jesus was, up to this point, he was healing people. Signs and wonders were being done. Miracles, right? Demons were being cast out. But they were all Jews. They were all people who had covenant with God. And so this Gentile woman, he come, they, she comes to Jesus because she had heard about the signs and wonders. She had heard about the healing. She had heard about the miracles, but she persisted because she was desperate. How many of you have ever been desperate? Where you begin to cry out to Jesus. And I have turned to everything else. I've done what everybody else has said to do. I've told all my friends about my situation. And I tried to follow their advice. I googled what I should do. And I did all those results. And she is at the end of her rope, and she's coming to Jesus, and she's saying, I've tried everything. Have mercy on I me. Mean, you are my only hope. And so she persists. Verse 25, it says, Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and to throw it to little dogs. Man, Jesus had, was having a rough day. You know, we read that and we sound like he's belittling her. He's putting her down. That she's not good enough. But how many of you know we're talking, the Jews had something that separated them from everybody else. They had a covenant with God. And because they were under covenant with God, their status was so much higher than everybody else. How many of you know when you have a covenant with God, your status is at a high level? 
much higher. You might look like everybody else. You might go to work like everybody else. But how many of you know if you are in Christ Jesus, you have covenant with the Almighty God and your status is not the same as everybody else's? In fact, your status is so much higher that Jesus is looking at this woman. He's saying, listen, this is such a, a high level that what you're asking for is like the difference between the level of a person and a dog. Now, I know some of you love your dogs and you talk to them like people, but they're not, right? They're not people. They're animals. We love them. I, I love dogs. They're my favorite because you know what? They're, you just have a good dog, and they're just such good boys, you know? And you talk to them in people voice, you know, they use a good boy, and then they're, right? And they, their whole body starts wagging, right? But they're not people. And Jesus was saying, listen, you don't have these covenant benefits available to you yet, right? I've come to minister to the house of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those who have already received these covenant benefits. And it is not good for me to take what is meant for the children— their bread, and to give it to this status of a little dog. You guys seeing this? He was trying to explain something to this woman, that, that this was bread that belonged to the children of God. But notice this woman's response. And she said, this reminds me of like that street smarts, you know, like she was convinced of something. But it says, she said, yes, Lord, Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Even the little dogs. This woman was saying, listen, I might not be in covenant right now, but even the dogs can eat the crumbs that come from that bread. And Jesus responds and says to her, you're right. You're right. And you can have it. And Jesus said to her, go home because your daughter is now well. And the Bible says she was healed at that very hour. Let me tell you, this woman, her daughter was healed on the crumbs. This daughter, who was demon-possessed, who had no other options, received healing and deliverance on crumbs. The leftovers... What do you think could happen if those crumbs can heal her daughter from the demonic? What can happen when you have the bread? When you have the whole loaf? Amen? So notice when Jesus says, I love this word. I love the word because it's so specific. He says the children's bread. What does that say? Jesus calls it, it's not good to take the children's bread. In other words, when God makes covenant, he doesn't see those benefits as his anymore. He's saying, no, no, this bread belongs to the children of God. This bread is, is not mine. In other words, God's not like, you know, some old man at the edge of a pond and he's just picking a piece and throwing it to the ducks, right? You can have one, none for you, no. No, he doesn't tease us, right? He's not given a bigger portion here and a lesser portion here. How many of you know he's saying, no, 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 no. I've already given you the bread. It's already yours. He's not saying my bread. He's saying the children's bread. In other words, the bread is already yours. It is for the children of God. And if you're a children, child of God, somebody say amen in this place. Amen. Somebody act like we've got something available to us. Somebody say Amen. Right? And so he has made something. He's saying that bread is the children's bread. It is yours. Everything that you need is right here. Everything you need. You know, you, it, maybe you're going through life and you need that healing slice of bread. Cut that off. That's available to you. Maybe you're in a place and you need some provision and, you, and you're, in, you're in dire straits. And how many of you know that's a slice that's available? That provision slice is available to you right? And maybe you're, you're walking with, in depression and you don't have hope. That, that slice of hope, that slice of peace, right? That slice of deliverance, that slice of freedom. How many of you know that is all contained in the children's bread and he has already given it to you? Amen? It belongs to you. And so when we approach God and we pray to the Lord, we got to watch how we engage now. 
Do we act like people that have already been given something, or do we act like someone that is begging for the crumbs? When we come to the Lord and we, we begin to ask and beg, I would say that's almost the equivalent of calling God a liar. Because you are saying, Lord, would you just bless me today? I, I, I know you're busy. I know you got a lot on your plate. And, you know, if you could just help me get through this day. And if you could just, you know, maybe just give me something. Just to, I just need a little boost today, right? When we beg for a blessing, it's like calling him a liar. Because we need to pray like we actually believe him. And like those blessings and those things that he has already said, uh, it's yours. We need to pray like it actually is true. Where we actually begin to say, God, I thank you, Lord, that all the earth is yours and everything in it. And, Lord, that you, there is no lack in your kingdom. And, Lord, that you have made the blessing of provision. You meet every need. And do you see the difference? Versus, God, I don't know what to do. Now, it's okay to be real and raw. And that might be your starting point. But that's not where we want to finish. We want to finish saying, God, I believe in you. I believe that what you said is true. I believe that you are filling my, ho my house with peace. I believe that you, that you are healing my body right now. You guys see what I'm saying? It belongs to you. There are so many people. There are so many believers in Christ. They are in covenant with God, but they don't experience the covenant benefits. See, this is the story of a, of a Gentile woman whose life was changed on the crumbs. And God is saying, I have a whole loaf and it's already yours. Yeah, but Lord, I, I know, but, but, but I'm just digging around for the crumbs. You know, I'm on my hands and knees and I'm just looking for some crumbs. He's like, I got this whole, I did this. Right? Amen. All right, I had you turn to Luke chapter 13. We'll end here. Luke chapter 13. And I want to start at verse 11. We, we looked at the story of a, of a Gentile woman. Now I want to look at the story of a, of a Jewish woman. This is a woman who is in covenant with God. It says, and behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. Everybody say 18 years. 18 years. You know, when you have a condition... For a couple months, maybe even a year, at least a couple years, at some point, your mind is going to start thinking, I guess this is just how it's always going to be. This woman had this condition for 18 years. And she was bent over and in, could in no way raise herself up. What is this saying? I've tried everything else. I've gone to all the doctors. I've taken all the medicines. I've done the, the holistic approaches. I've done all those things. But she could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her. Now, do you notice the difference between the Gentile woman and the Jewish woman already? How did he know this woman was a Jewish? They were, Jew, they were at the synagogue. They were worshiping. And Jesus saw her there in this condition, and he said, that's not right. There is something off about this situation because I know this woman is in covenant with God. She is, she is of the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Jesus calls to her, calls her to him and said to her, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. In other words, Jesus saw this woman who was in covenant. He, he knew this is not the way that it's supposed to be. She has covenant with God. And so he says to her, you are loose from your infirmity. In other words, Jesus is saying, I have come so that the people of God, the people of promise, the people who have all these benefits, I have come so that their eyes could be opened to these benefits, that these things are available to them. That this is the way it ought to be. She shouldn't be bent over anymore. She ought to be up straight. Why? Because she has covenant. Everybody say covenant. She has promise. And so he laid hands on her, 
and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, there are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. You know, think about this. This synagogue leader. I bet you this woman has been going to this synagogue, this temple, worshiping every week, every Sabbath day for years. And Jesus comes in and heals this woman. And he's like, I'm not getting the credit. She's been here all along. And now this guy comes, and she's made well. And the Lord answered him and said, Hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? Notice verse 16. So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound. Notice what Jesus even says. Think of it. You can almost hear his, his repulsion to this man's response. He's saying, think of it. She has been in bondage for 18 years. Why on earth should we ever make her wait another day? He's saying, ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? Jesus is saying, this woman who has covenant with God, ought she not receive this benefit? Ought she not be healed? You see, this isn't a moment where it's just the grace of God to heal. This woman wasn't just being healed on the crumbs. She was bound for 18 years, and, and Jesus is saying this is the way it should have been all along. The stars didn't align. She ought to be healed. Everybody say ought. Let me tell you, there are things that we tolerate in our lives for far too long. There are things that we allow. Mental attitudes, ways of thinking, disabilities and, and discouragements, unforgiveness. There's all these things that the Lord is saying, ought not you experience these benefits too? Why? Because she was born into covenant. Jesus is saying this woman is not subject like everybody else. God promised to bless the descendants of Abraham. Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, be healed? Amen? You see, if this woman was born into the promise of blessing. How many of us, how many of you and me, being born again in Christ Jesus, have this same blessing available to us? He's saying, ought not you receive these benefits? Haven't I already given you the whole loaf? Have I not given you the children's bread? You see, if you are born again and you belong to Jesus, we should be seeing benefits. We should be seeing fruitfulness. Doesn't mean that there's not persecution. Listen, I'm not saying that it's going to be even easy. Listen, Paul walked with the Lord, and he got messed up. Amen? He was on assignment. But the Lord carried him through all those things. And the Lord is saying, listen, I have benefits that belong to you. Ought not you be experiencing them the way you should? You see, Jesus stood up for this covenant. Jesus called this woman out. He corrected this synagogue ruler. He was standing up for this covenant so that our eyes could be opened that this is for us. If you belong to Christ, then you are heirs of the promise. Jesus is saying this is available. This is yours. Amen? Let's go ahead and stand together. We're going to close here. I have a whole lot more, but you know what? We got more time. I want us to... How many of you have the sense, though, of what the Lord is saying? Just right where you're at. Amen? We just far underestimate what God wants to do. We far... We, we give way too much toleration to the status quo. And we look to, for our answers, and we look to do the things that everybody else is doing. And I believe what the Lord is saying is, I want you to look to me. I want you to trust in me. 
I want you to, to know that I've already done everything that I could possibly do so that you could be sure that this is for you. I want to I read this scripture real quick out of Hebrews chapter 6, and then we're going to pray. But Hebrews 6, 13 says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. So number one, we know that this is true because God said it's true, and God cannot lie. He's saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. In other words, blood covenant was the way that all disputes were ended. It was how you knew this is guaranteed. There is no turning back. When there was blood covenant, it, well, your life is now my life. My life is now your life. We are one. And, and, and what the author is saying in Hebrews, he's saying, listen, not only did God swear by his word, he has sworn by his blood that this is available to you. Verse 18, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, strong hope, strong assurance, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. How many of you know there is things that the Lord has set before you that we are to receive? There is a meal that has been prepared. There is a table that has been set. And he's saying, I want you to come, dine with me, be with me. I've already done. I've already paid the price. I've already done everything that's necessary. Now, receive what I have done. How do we receive? Well, number one, we got to make sure that We've taken care and we've received the forgiveness of sin. We need to walk right before the Lord. We need to ask for repentance. And the Bible says that when we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Right? We want to walk with the Lord. We want to be set apart for him. But, but number two, we give him thanks. We praise him. And we say, God, I trust you. I receive what you've done. I was talking to Pastor Andrea. She's in California right now. And she was just asking how things, she's like, I know there's a lot going on. I'm like, there is a lot going on. And I know you're busy. I am busy. She's like, but I feel like the Lord's saying, I want you to lift your hands and receive his blessing right now. How many of you know we need to position ourselves to receive that blessing? And oftentimes it is done very simply by lifting our head, looking to him, raising our hands and saying, God, I receive from you today. I receive that here. I receive that peace. How many of you know it's done? It's secured. He's saying, I want to give it to you. Ought not you, being a child of God, receive this blessing? Can we receive the blessing that the Lord has for us today? Can we just lift our hands to him? Father, we do. We lift our hands to you. Lord, we receive your promises to us by faith right now. Lord, I believe that, Lord, that even as we're speaking this, this brief word, but, Lord, I believe that you are awakening hearts, that you are speaking by your spirit, Lord, that you are showing people the things, Lord, that you have prepared for them to inherit, the things that you have already made available, and you're saying, I have this bread for you today. And, Lord, we don't want to just walk idly by and pretend like nothing has changed, but, Lord, we lift our hands to receive from you today. In Jesus' name. Lord, just say this with me. Say, Lord, I receive from you today. I receive what Jesus has purchased for me. It belongs to me. And Lord, I see in your word that there are things that I need that belong to me. They belong to me by covenant. And so I'm deciding today that I'm not settling for anything less. I will not settle for anything less than what you have for me. I won't settle for a life without your covenant benefits. So I'm coming to you this day, and I'm saying, whatever the Lord Jesus goes before me to possess, I will possess. And so I receive that healing today. 
I receive peace today. I receive restoration today. I receive your deliverance today. I receive breakthrough today by the power of the living God. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.